Well, good morning, JICF, and good morning to any visitors who might be joining us today for our time of worship. We're so glad that all of you are, are tuned in with us and joining us today. Today, we're going to be continuing our, our study through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're at Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35 for today. And the title of our message is, We Forgive Because We've Been Forgiven. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Last week, John Freiberg preached from Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, and we learned from that text um, what we should do if another brother or sister in the Lord sins against us. And so, talking a little bit about church discipline there. But the overall theme and topic is, is really about forgiveness. It's when another brother or sister sins against us, and the ultimate goal is how they can be restored in their relationship with the Lord and also with the body of Christ. And so Jesus gives this teaching in verses 15 through 20. And then in verses 21 through 22 in our text for today, uh, Peter, his disciple, has a follow-up question for Jesus. And uh, allow me to read verses 21 through 22. I'm going to read as we walk through this text, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version of God's word. So let me read in verses 21 to 22. The Bible says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. We'll stop right there. So again, Peter comes up to Jesus. Jesus has been, you know, teaching on this topic of forgiveness, and uh, Peter says, "Hey, Jesus, so you know, if I, if my, if my brother or my sister sins against me, and I forgive them seven times, they've sinned against me seven times. Like that's enough, right, Jesus?" And Jesus says, "No, Peter, no. If your brother or sister sins against you, you should forgive them seventy times seven, meaning." Jesus' point was, you should forgive a brother or sister as many times or every time they sin against you. It's unlimited forgiveness. And in verses 23 through 35, uh, the rest of our text for today, Jesus, again, teaches spiritual truths through a parable, as he so often did. And he does that here in the parable of the unforgiving servant. And what he wanted to teach his disciples then and what he's still teaching us, his disciples today, is the why behind why we should forgive a person every time they sin against us. And Jesus' overarching point from this text, from this parable is we should forgive others because we ourselves have been forgiven so much more. We should forgive, forgive others because we've been forgiven so much more. Well, before we get into this text, let's pray and ask God's help. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word and the opportunity, Lord, to be able to study it together this morning. I ask that your spirit uh, would uh, illumine our minds, would open our hearts so we can understand your word and then give us, O oh Holy Spirit, the ability to apply it into our lives. Help your servant. May he decrease and Jesus increase. I ask, O oh Lord, for the anointing of your spirit, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me keep reading on. I'm going to read verses 23 through 27 of our text. The Bible says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus teaching, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. I'm going to stop right there. 
And the first point I'd like for us to see, I'd like for us to draw from this text is, we owe God a debt that we are incapable of paying. Church, we owe God a debt that we are incapable of paying. We see that here in verses 23 through 27 of our passage of Scripture for today. Well, let us let me kind of unpack the text a bit so we understand what's going on. We understand, you know, really how much 10,000 talents is worth. Well, see, one talent uh, during Jesus' time, one talent would have been worth 20 years of wages for a common laborer. And this first servant owed his master, the king, the text tells us, 10,000 talents. So what that means is this servant would have have needed to work approximately 200,000 years to pay back the debt that he owed his master. It's an enormous, enormous debt that he has toward his master. And in verse 26 of our text, it's, it's quite humorous that the first servant thinks he can actually pay the debt back, right? Because he goes to the master and he, he begs for the master's patience. He begs that his master, the king, would give him more time to pay off the debt. Well, just to give you an idea, using modern equivalents in today's times, just how much this 10,000 talents would be, uh, dear friends, it would be approximately this. Let's say, and I'm, I'm going to use U.S. dollars, okay? So let's say a common laborer earns, in today's time, $15 an hour uh, at 2,000 hours a year of work. So $15 an hour, works 2,000 years, I mean 2,000 hours in a year, then he or she would have a, a yearly salary of about 30,000 U.S. dollars, okay? Well, you take that 30,000, you multiply it times 20 years, that'd be 600,000 U.S. dollars. That'd be one talent. It'd be worth one talent in our story. So then you take the 10,000 talents that the first servant owed his master. You multiply that times, and again, modern equivalent, 600,000 U.S. dollars. The servant owed his master approximately 6 billion U.S. dollars. Can you imagine? (laughs) This is a debt that he obviously could not pay. This is an enormous, insurmountable amount of money. That's how big his debt was. Well, then the story goes on in verse 27. What what did the king do? Well, the Bible tells us here that the king, the master of the first servant, he felt pity for the first servant. He showed him mercy and, and he released his servant. He released him. He forgave his debt. He canceled his debt. You see, the only way the servant could have been forgiven his debt was if the master, him, his master himself, forgave him his debt. Brothers and sisters, Jesus used this parable to help us realize how enormous our debt is to God for our sins against him. And how we ourselves are totally incapable of repaying such an insurmountable debt. Only God has the authority and the power to forgive our sins against Him. But you know, unfortunately, I think many people then, many people even today, still try to pay their debt off themselves. They try to do it through religion. They try to do it through doing good deeds, doing good works. And I think, you know, perhaps, you know, maybe even in in the church, there are people that think, well, you know, if I if I serve enough, you know, if I'm involved in enough Christian ministry, if I give enough, if I, you know, give my tithes and offerings, perhaps if I teach a Sunday school, or I am generous to reach out to the poor, that, you know, that can pay off my sin debt. Well, it can't. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 64, 6, and I like the New Living Translations uh, translation of, of this verse, Isaiah 64, 6, the Bible says, we are all infected and impure with sin. 
when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. So what that means is because we're all polluted with sin, okay, we fall, fallen short of the glory of God. When we try in our own power and strength to do good, thinking that that's going to appease God's wrath, God's condemnation, that that's going to somehow, you know, urge God to forgive us, it doesn't work because our righteous deeds, our good works done in and of ourselves and our own power, they're like filthy rags before God. We can't do it. We can't pay off our debt on our own. But praise be to God, church. You and I can have our debt paid off. We can experience forgiveness. Why? Because our God is rich in mercy. What does it mean that God is a God of mercy? What does this word mean? Well, let me help to help us to understand. What does it mean that God is a God of mercy? Well, God, of course, is the righteous judge. And he has full authority, full authority to judge us. He has full authority as the righteous judge, as the creator of, of the whole universe and everything in it. He has the right to judge us. He has the right to condemn us for our sins. But because God is merciful, he withholds his condemnation. He withholds his wrath toward us. That, of course, we deserve because of our enormous and treacherous sin against him who is holy. God being merciful Instead of pouring out his wrath on us in compassion, in pity for us in our sinful, helpless, and hopeless states, he forgives us. He cancels our sin debt. That's a brief explanation of God's mercy. But you see, what we need to understand is someone had to pay this enormous sin debt that you and I owe God. God just doesn't turn his back on sin. He doesn't look at sin and just kind of, eh, I think I'll brush it under the rug, so to speak. Someone had to pay our sin debt in full. And who was that? Who paid our enormous sin debt that we owe God because we've sinned against him? Well, Jesus Christ, his son, did. Jesus Christ paid our sin debt in full on the cross, dear friends. You see, the father's mission for sending his son to this earth was to, was to send him to a cross and to put our sins on his sinless son. God's wrath against you and me was withheld, but unleashed on his son there on the cross. Jesus Christ's substitutionary sacrifice on the cross paid our sin debt that we owe God, and he paid it in full. The righteous, that being Jesus, for us, the unrighteous. For all of us who've repented of our sins, and put our trust in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, guess what? We've been declared not guilty. We are debt-free before God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that make you feel so thankful to God and to Jesus, his son, that God himself would cancel our debt? That God himself would forgive us our sins through the sacrificial death of his son. Oh, dear friends, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, may a day never go by that we don't thank and praise and show our gratitude to God for what he's done for us in Jesus, his son. Paul says, Paul explains 
so much better about God's mercy and Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice in Titus 3, verses 3 through 7, than I ever could. Let me just read it for us. Titus 3, verses 3 through 7, about what God has done for us and His Son. Uh, Paul wrote in verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Paul's describing our, our state before we experience God's salvation in Christ. That's who we are. But in verse four, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Hallelujah, church. Isn't that wonderful news? Aren't you thankful to God for what he's done for us in Jesus? He's canceled our sin debt. He's forgiven us of our sins. But you know, for anyone who rejects, anyone who disregards the forgiveness that God has made available through the death of his son, Jesus Christ on the cross, that person, friends, they're still guilty. They're still guilty of sin. And that person still has an outstanding debt toward God. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, part A, the wages of sin is death. That means the payoff, the payday, the consequence of living and dying in our sin is eternal death. It's condemnation in hell forever. That's a horrible thing. That's a horrible thing. But again, praise be to God. In Romans 8, 1, Paul wrote, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, dear friend, listen closely. If you are not in Christ Jesus, you need to understand that all of us have sinned against holy God. Okay, But God, being rich in mercy, God in His amazing grace, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. Never sinned, was tempted, but never sinned. And ultimately, Jesus Christ died a, a, subs, a, a sacrificial, substitutionary death on the cross. Jesus Christ took all our sins upon Himself. Jesus Christ bore the negative consequences of our sin on the cross. He, he bore God's wrath against sin for you and for me. And God did that for us in and through His Son because He loves you and He loves me. He wishes none to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Jesus died on the cross to cancel our sin debt. Jesus died on the cross to make us in right standing with God. He died, was buried, He rose on the third day. And anyone who repents of their sin, confesses their sin to God, turns from their sin and places their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, trusts in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Oh, dear friend, your sins will be forgiven. Your debt will be canceled. God will look at you as if you've never sinned and you are free. The Bible says, if we've been freed by Jesus, we are free indeed. We are free in Jesus. If the Son has set us free, we are free in Jesus. The, and we are no longer under condemnation. If you've never put your trust in Jesus, you do that today. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another minute. Do it today. Well, let's continue on in our text in verses 28 through 35. Let me read for us Matthew 18, verses 28 through 35. We saw our first major point from this text is we, we, have, a, we have a debt towards God that we cannot pay back. We cannot pay. It's too enormous. Well, let's see the second point uh, that I want to draw from this text today. Let me carry on. In verse 28, the Bible says Jesus was saying, but when that same servant went out, that's the first servant that we've been talking about. When he went out, he found one of his fellow servants. We'll call this fellow servant, servant number two. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. 
So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Dear friends, the second major point I want us to see from the second half of Jesus' parable here is this. And it's the title of the message today. We forgive because we've been forgiven. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Well, let me unpack a little bit of this, uh, these verses here to help us understand the context. Well, one denarius, okay, was a day's wages for a common laborer, okay? And it, it says here, the second servant owed the first servant 100 denarii. So that would have been about 20 weeks worth of labor, all right? 20 weeks worth of labor. Uh, in today's terms, if we use those modern equivalents that we used earlier, that'd be about 12,000 U.S. dollars. About 12,000 U.S. dollars. Still a large amount of money, but was no comparison to the 10,000 talents to the 200,000 years the first servant would have to work to pay off his debt to the king. Doesn't compare at all to the six billion dollar debt the first servant owed his master okay uh it was just paled in comparison right uh six billion dollars compared to twelve thousand dollars well you would have thought that the first servant would have shown mercy and extended forgiveness to the second servant because of the mercy and the forgiveness that his master had granted towards him well it doesn't happen what happens, the first 28 in our text, it says the first servant grabbed the second servant, choked him, demanded him that he pay back his debt to him. The second servant then begs the first servant for patience, just give me time to pay the debt back. But the first servant, again, unlike what had been done to him, the mercy that had been shown to him, he uh, refused to uh, to show mercy he does not grant forgiveness, and he throws the second servant, second servant, in prison, and until he could pay his debt back. See that in verse in verse thirty. Well, other servants, other fellow servants, uh, they they saw how the first servant was had treated the second servant after he had been after the first servant had been treated treated so mercifully, so graciously by the king. Well. They saw this is not right. This is not just. This is not fair. And they reported his actions to the king. Well, the king then calls the first servant in. He's very angry with the first servant. And he, he addresses the wickedness of the first servant's heart. For the first servant's total disregard of the mercy and the forgiveness that he himself, the king, had shown to him by canceling his enormous debt. And you see, the true condition of the first servant's heart was made obvious by how he treated the second servant. The second servant had a debt to him, but it was hardly comparable at all to the debt the first servant had to the king. He had been forgiven so much but he took it for granted. It didn't mean anything to him. He just wanted his money back, his $12,000 back from the second servant compared to the $6 billion that he owed the king. And the king condemned the first servant. We see that in verse 34. He throws him in jail. He says, you're going to be there until you can pay me back. Well, the first servant obviously would never have been able to pay back the king. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. But what we see is the first servant never truly appreciated 
the forgiveness that had been granted him by his master. In verse 35, Jesus concluded his teaching here in Matthew 18 about forgiveness by saying that, you know, if we don't extend mercy, if we don't grant forgiveness to others who sin against us, then that shows that we ourselves have not truly experienced God's forgiveness in our own heart. And therefore, we're still under condemnation. We're still dead in our trespasses and sins. We're still guilty. We're still guilty of our sin. But you know, on the flip side of that, if we've truly experienced God's forgiveness in our heart, then we understand, brothers and sisters, how spiritually bankrupt we are. We, we understand how unworthy we are of God's grace, how undeserving we are of his mercy. And we're overcome with gratitude, with thankfulness to God, because in our helpless and hopeless bankrupt condition, God extended grace. He granted mercy to us. We understand we have been forgiven so much. Therefore, because we've been forgiven so much in Christ Jesus, when others sin against us, we want to show the same grace, the same mercy, the same forgiveness that God has shown to us in His Son. We want to put in practice what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 and verse 32 when he said, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We forgive others because God's forgiven us in Christ. You know, when someone does sin against us, it's not to, to disregard the fact that there's pain involved. It hurts. I think if we've lived long enough, you know, other people have, have sinned against us. Maybe they have said something behind our back that's untrue. They've slandered us or they've broken our trust. And when things like that happens, it hurts. It really does. And, and we can't deny that. And we shouldn't deny that. You know, but I really like what Jerry Bridges uh, said in his book, Transforming Grace, about the pain that we undergo as Christians. And I think with include, included within this is the pain we undergo as Christians when, when others sin against us. Uh, Bridges wrote this, and I'll quote him. He said, God never allows pain without a purpose in the lives of his children. He never allows Satan nor circumstances nor any ill-intending person to afflict us unless he uses that affliction for our good. God never wastes pain. He always causes it to work together for our ultimate good, the good of conforming us more to the likeness of his son. And then he referenced Romans 8, verses 28 through 29 there. So basically what he was saying here is, is based on Romans 8, verses 28 to 29. It talks about our ultimate good is being being conformed more into the image of Christ Jesus, our Lord. I thought that's very good. And maybe some of you listening today need to hear that. Maybe you're still experiencing pain from the past. Pain because someone you know, someone who's maybe dear to you, has sinned against you. Trust has been broken and, and you're hurt. Well, I just want you to be encouraged by the quote that I just read in, by Jerry Bridges in Transforming Grace that God never wastes our pain, but he works through that to make us more like Jesus, which is our ultimate good. It's our ultimate good. So stay strong. Persevere and know that, know that truth, brother and sister. God's working through your pain. He's not wasting. You know, 
when we choose to forgive, another point about forgiveness and, and the good of extending forgiveness to others when they sin against us is when we forgive others, we, we release resentment, we release anger and bitterness in our heart, and we're free to love again and to love others again as God wants us to. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing. But we also understand forgiveness sometimes is a process, right? We see in, in, in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, the, the passage right above our passage for today, that you know, when confronting a brother and sister who sinned against us, sometimes there's there's these steps involved, right? That Brother John explained about last week. And it's not like all that happens instantaneously. Okay? There's a process oftentimes within forgiveness. Even in my own life, you know, uh, when, when someone is, has sinned against me, yeah, it's maybe taken some time, you know, for me to really, you know, just be praying about that and asking God for grace to be able to forgive them, you know, continuing to go back to the gospel and, and remember how much I've been forgiven. And then through that, that helps me then to forgive them because I've been forgiven much. But it is a process. And, and maybe you're still in that process. But what's important is you want to forgive. You know you should. And you're taking those steps, you know, uh, to, to forgive that person that, that has offended you with their sin. Another thing to say about forgiveness, church, is that, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean when we forgive that we always forget, you know, the pain that was involved uh, or that, 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 that painful, hurtful experience that we, um, that we encountered when someone sins against us. It doesn't mean that we forget the experience. We, for, we necessarily forget the pain. But when we forgive, what it does mean is, is that we choose not to remember um, that person's sins against us again. And to drill down uh, a bit a bit deeper, we don't bring it up. Someone sins against us and we forgive them, we don't bring up their sin again to that person or anyone else. And we see them as not guilty, just as God in Christ sees us now not guilty. We don't bring it up. We don't bring it up. And another good thing about forgiveness, and particularly towards a non-believer, is when we forgive a non-believer who sinned against us, it's it's an opportunity to be a witness of God's grace, to be a, a witness of God's mercy, you know, to to demonstrate God's forgiveness to them. And Gospel conversations can arise from that. We forgive them. They might ask us questions like, I know I really hurt you, but yet you forgive me. And we can explain why we're able to forgive them because we've been forgiven so much by God in and through uh, the death of his son. And when we forgive brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a great opportunity to help them grow. It's a great opportunity to help restore them back into right fellowship with God and with the body of Christ, with us and the body of Christ. Okay. And Paul talks about that in Galatians uh, 6 1. So, and that's why we need to go to a brother and sister if they've sinned against us, if they haven't come to us first, or maybe they don't recognize that they've offended us where there's in. That's why we need to go to them because the ultimate goal in going to them is is for their restoration with God and with the body and with the body of Christ. Well, dear friends, church, hopefully through today's passage, through today's message, um, we've all been reminded uh, to forgive others because we ourselves have been forgiven so much by God in Christ Jesus. And I also hope and I pray that if there's still the sins of of another that you're still holding on to, you're still harboring in your heart, I want to encourage you, forgive that person today. Forgive that person today. Forgive them because you've been reminded through the word of God today how much you've been forgiven by God. 
And lastly, if any of you tuning in today have never experienced God's forgiveness in your own life, I want to encourage you, as I already have earlier in the message, confess your sins to God. Turn from them, repent of them. Tell God how sorry you are. And turn to Jesus Christ, God's Son. Put your trust in Jesus, your trust in His finished work on the cross to cancel your sin debt, a debt that you and I could never, never pay off ourselves. Put your trust in Him and be made free. Let God declare you not guilty. Trusting Jesus, following Him, being in a love relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is the best thing that I've ever done. It's the best thing that anybody could ever do. If you hadn't done that, you do that today. You do that today, dear friend. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the forgiveness that you've made available through Jesus Christ, your son, and his death on the cross. For us, we're so unworthy, we're so undeserving, but because you love us so much, Lord, because you're a God of mercy, you've done that for us. Oh, Lord, because we've been forgiven much, help us to forgive much. Help us to forgive others who sinned against us as we remember what you've done for us. And Lord God, if there's anyone uh, with us today who's never experienced your forgiveness in, in your son, oh God, I ask that today would be the day of salvation for them. Today would be the day that they repent of their sins and they put their trust in Jesus Christ, that they'd be forgiven of their sin, that they would become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Lord, that they would have eternal life. Help them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, again for your, your word. Bless your people and bless the people of JSEF. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.